So this morning we're going to find ourselves in Luke chapter 24. We're going to be looking, reading actually, verses 1 through 12. And then we'll be examining something that Paul the Apostle wrote 23 years after the resurrection of Jesus. Paul wrote to a group of believers at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And so a couple of things as we prepare our hearts. I titled the message this morning, If Christ Had Not Risen. It's the title of the message out of Luke chapter 15, or excuse me, Luke chapter 24 and 1 Corinthians 15. So as we've been taking a series of verses throughout uh, this week and kind of walking through what we call the Passion Week, we now end up in chapter 24, where the title in my Bible, at least it says, He is risen. Let's look at verse 1. Let's draw our attention there. Luke chapter 24 and verse 1. It says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and then the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. We look at the passage here in Luke chapter 24, and it is what we would call the resurrection passage. And where we see that the disciples of Jesus and also the women that followed Jesus came to the tomb of Jesus on Sunday morning. We know that Christ was crucified on the Passover there on Friday. We celebrated this together as a body here on Good Friday. Jesus was laid to the tomb that evening. And Jesus' body in the tomb there all day Saturday, Jesus was risen from the dead early Sunday morning. The Bible says here in verse 1, Now on the first day of the week, which would be Sunday, very early in the morning, is when they came to find the tomb empty. Perhaps many questions, sorrow filled their hearts and their minds. Even though these women desired to give Jesus a proper burial, because Jesus' body had to be taken down quickly and placed in the tomb, and Jesus was not given a proper burial. This was done out of love. But notice the atmosphere. The atmosphere was that Jesus had died. Death had now invaded their relationship that they had with Jesus their rabbi, their savior, their Lord, the one who had been with them for a period of about three years. All of them have had their different encounters and stories with Jesus. But some of the greatest stories were the miracles that Jesus performed among the people. They seen the dead raised. They seen the blind able to see, the deaf able to hear, the mute able to speak. They saw lepers being healed. They seen many miracles feeding of 4,000, feeding of 5,000. Men, and women, and children beside. There was a multitude of miracles that they seen time and time again. And yet all of this ended in one fateful blow when Jesus was on the cross and he yielded up his spirit and he died. These women come to the tomb to take care of a body that was once full of life and power. In their mind, all power and life is gone. What would be the sum of their life after this day? 
Well, as we see that in Matthew's gospel, in the same account, the Bible says that as these women were on their way to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus and give him a proper burial, the one thing that was on their mind is who's going to roll the stone away so that we can get in. Their hearts had already made a decision that Jesus' body was in the tomb. And they went there to find him there. But here in Luke's gospel, it says that when they came, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. You could imagine as their minds and their hearts were perplexed, right? Perhaps blown away as to what could have possibly happened. I mean, this is the last place where we know he had been laid. The Bible says that it was a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea in Matthew's gospel that requested that the body of Jesus would be given to him so that he could lay it in a tomb. Jesus was laid in the tomb. You see, everyone must come to terms just like these disciples of Jesus with the reality of death. These women came to terms with the reality of death. Jesus is dead. One way or another, people in general can, number one, passively deny death by ignoring it, the reality and avoiding talking about it. And oftentimes some people do. They're so fearful of death and they and they passively deny death or they create other things to believe and they ignore the reality of it and thinking that by denying it or ignoring it that they can avoid it. But listen, death is a guarantee. Second thing we see is that people actively battle death. How do they actively battle it? By warding off its fast approaching signs via diet or exercise, taking care of their bodies. Whatever the case might be, though those things are good, some people do this simply because they're told to by doctors. Your prescription to live is to live better. Eat right. Take care of yourself. Some people make this their God because they want to cheat death. They think that in some way they'll live longer, and perhaps there are those that even believe they'll live forever. Some of us might know people like that. Third thing we see is that tragically they embrace it by psychologically twisting death into something that is not even the Corinthians. As I told you, Paul's letter to them were attempting to cope with death, perhaps in some of these ways. I like these thoughts by Kent Hughes. He says, everyone must come to terms with what happens after death. You see here, the women were coming to terms with death. Facing the reality, to them, it is over. But everyone has to come to terms with what happens after death. There are three major explanations that we see in life for understanding this very dealing. Dealing with what happens after death. Number one, the body and the soul cease to exist after death. We term this hedonism, which then pushes you into a life before death of survival. In this view, there is nothing beyond this life, so this position often leads to hedonism. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If a person simply ceases to exist, then this life becomes about survival and indulgence. In other words, the philosophy of the world is, if it feels good, do it. Though plenty of people who hold this view happen to be upstanding and some even moral people. But they lack a robust grounding for their morality or humanitarianism. Another, the second, would be the body ceases to exist, but the soul lives on. Now this was a philosophy that was even circulating during the time of Christ. We call this dualism, mysticism. It's what the Greeks believed. You see, in ancient times, the body was viewed as, by the Greeks and their mythology, a very vile and evil thing. But they viewed the soul quite differently. They viewed the soul as that which is good. And the viewpoint is still quite common today, even among some Christians. This perspective can lead to a form of escapism that ignores the physical world. You see, and let me add something to this. This is why Greek philosophers in those in these days would reject 
the resurrection of Jesus and reject the resurrection as a whole. Why? Because if this body is not good and it's evil, it is a disgusting thing for it to be resurrected again. The third thing we see is that the body and the soul continue to exist by way of resurrection. We call this holism. This is the view that scriptures present, but it is nearly impossible to comprehend because of the pervasiveness and certainty of death. There is no reason to believe that holistic humans, uh, the, the body and the soul will continue to exist at some point in the future unless there is reason to believe that death has been defeated, that it is precisely what the Bible states, death has been swallowed up by the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ. Whatever the case might be today, this is not just a once a year where we come and we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord even more so. We need to examine our own hearts and our own lives and realize the power of the resurrection and what it speaks for us today. If Christ had not been risen, just think of the scene that's surrounding the tomb here. Here you have a group of women and they are perplexed, the Bible says in verse 4. They are perplexed. They were not expecting to see or perhaps expecting to come to an empty tomb. They were actually expecting to find Jesus dead. I think that says a lot. It says that from the time in which they saw Jesus on the cross to the time that he was laid in the tomb, that they had resolved in their heart that all that he ever proclaimed and done, everything that has happened, perhaps for this moment, it's over. And they figured he's dead, he's gone. Verse 4 kind of gives us this interesting view here that they have actually kind of received it in their heart that Jesus was dead. It was C.S. Lewis who said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun is risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. In the same way, the resurrection, we can say it this way, that we see the resurrection not as a thing to look at, but as an event that we see everything else through. What does it mean when we come to this? Well, there's a couple of things that we should consider in regards to the resurrection. A couple of things it does for the ministry of Jesus Christ and what has been preached and proclaimed throughout the ages. Why the resurrection? Number one, because it proclaims. The proclamation of the resurrection is that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what Romans chapter 1 and verse 4 says. Jesus is the Son of God. You see, for the Christian, that's easy to embrace because of the preaching and teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It also proclaims that Jesus' sacrifice was accepted. Jesus, being raised from the dead, testifies that his sacrifice was accepted before God the Father, according to Romans chapter 4 and verse 24 and 25. The third thing is it proclaims the newness of life. You see, the very power of the resurrection, as we've heard stated, so many passages that we can share but just that great reminder that the resurrection of Jesus Christ puts an end to the bondage of sin in our lives. That's what Romans chapter 6 and verse 4 says, that we have a new life. Paul utters those famous words, for sin shall no longer have dominion over me in verse 14. Think about the power of sin and its grip that it can have on someone's life. We know it all too well because we've been there. Another thing that the resurrection does is it proclaims eternal life and an end to sin and death. The resurrection proclaims eternal life. What does that mean? It doesn't only mean that we will be in heaven in all eternity with Jesus, but it means that we truly never die. We live forever. Now, I know that might be hard for some people to swallow because our entire lives we've seen so many things die around us. Loved ones, family members, parents, some of us even children. Death has become something common 
to the life that every person lives. We notice that if it's not the loss or the life of someone, we know that things around us die. Things have expiration dates. Nothing lasts forever in this life. With this proclamation of eternal life and an end to sin and death, we see according to Romans chapter 6 in verses 5 through 11, the very truth and power of this. You see, the resurrection in what they have come, they have not yet experienced it yet. They come to a tomb and what they're blown away by is that the body of Jesus is not here. I want you guys just for a moment just to kind of put yourself in their place. The Bible says in verse four, two men stood by them in shining garments. I kind of love this whole picture. We've done a lot of things with these, right? You, you teach the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the different gospels. But, you know, the truth and the reality is, is that the angels appear to encourage. But Jesus also appears at the tomb, not in it, but outside of it. You know, there have been from the very start of the resurrection, those who have begun to deny it before Christ was even risen, before Christ could even be raised from the dead, doubts of the resurrection had already arisen and it became a common belief and a common view from the very start. As a matter of fact, remember what was said in Matthew's gospel in regards to the resurrection of Jesus. The Bible says in verse 62 of Matthew chapter 27, it says, and on the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive. I think that's an interesting thing, while he was still alive. The religious leaders are saying, we remember while he was still alive, implying what? That they believed with all of their heart that Jesus was dead. Well, they said, sir, we remember while he was still alive, how that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise. Isn't it interesting that the disciples come to the tomb and they're shocked that the body's not there. Not one of them have drawn the conclusion that Christ is risen from the dead. But yet the religious leaders who put Jesus on the cross and who, and who made a big thing about killing Jesus, well, guess what? They believe more than the disciples do. Just in case if this guy was right. I mean, after all, he performed a lot of miracles. He did say that after three days he will rise. Therefore, command the tomb to be secure. Listen to this. Until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, saying to the people, he is risen from the dead. You see what they're saying there? They're saying, listen. What we need to do is we need to seal this tomb. You need to set guards on it. You need to make sure that nobody goes in and out. Nobody is able to tamper or do anything with up until the third day, he says, because he says on the third day he will rise. And here's the thing. Deception has already started. They believe that Jesus was the originator of deception, but this very conversation that they're having is deception at its core. Look at what it says here. So the last deception will be worse than the first. What are they talking about? The last deception here is that Christ is raised from the dead. What was the first deception? That Jesus is the Christ. They rejected it. And they said, listen, if his disciples steal his body, then this last deception is going to be worse than the first. Because they're going to go around and they're going to say that the body of Jesus was stolen. Who made this false thing up? The religious leaders did. The very start of Jesus being laid in the tomb was already met with rejecting that Christ could be risen from the dead couple of other theories, one called the hallucination theory, that perhaps that when Jesus appeared to all these people that, that they were just hallucinating because of their emotions, it was so high. And what, and what Mary seen at the tomb was a stone rolled away and, and the disciples, Peter and John, went in to look and, and, and all that they seen, the body was not there, the linen cloths were lying there and the angel had even spoke to them that it was all just a hallucination that it wasn't what they really seen. Now that might be so with the group that went there. But what do you do over a period of about 50 days, right? 
where Jesus appeared to over 500 people. Not all at the tomb, but in different places. What do you do with Saul of Tarsus in the book of Acts in chapter 9? Who saw the resurrected Lord? What do you do with all these people at different points in their lives during that time that seen Jesus, the resurrected Lord, in different places at different times and they all had the same hallucination? I think the one who made up the hallucination theory was hallucinating himself. The other one that we see here in Matthew chapter 27 in verses 65 and 66, that the body of Jesus was stolen. Well, the religious leader started that one. And no, nobody was hallucinating and nobody stole his body. Here's another one. It's called the swoon theory. In other words, they say that he, here's what happened. Jesus endured all this pain, lost a lot of blood. It was like the worst, you know, thing that could have ever happened, trauma to somebody's body. And what happens is that Jesus, rather than dying, Jesus passed out. He passed out. And when his body was laid in this tomb, the coolness of the tomb and the coolness of the stone that they laid his body upon, in some way, what took place inside that tomb resuscitated his body from this coma that Jesus was in. Well, if that's the case then, was Jesus strong enough after that to move the stone so he can walk out? Obviously, the swoon theory was easily rejected and refuted even by the religious leaders of their day because according to John chapter 19 and verses 31 through 37, it was the Sanhedrin and here in Matthew chapter 27, the Pharisees who out of their own mouths and we also see the Roman soldier that stood by that said he's dead. All of them testified that Jesus was in fact dead. So the swoon theory is just another theory. But how about this one? Another one that has been kind of circling around, kind of as old as the stolen body theory, would be the no burial theory. In other words, they believe that Jesus was never laid in the tomb, that he was never placed there. But what's interesting is you would have to now go against the accounts of the Roman soldiers who took the time to seal the tomb because they knew that the body of Jesus was in there. Friends of mine, here's what I can tell you. People will call you crazy. People will say you're dumb. People will say it's just a myth. It's all lies. People will criticize and ridicule you. Many theories have gone out. Hallucination, stolen body, swoon theory, no burial. And perhaps even the one where they believe that Jesus' disciples themselves stole the body. How could it be that these disciples who would steal Jesus' body would be willing to die for a lie? I have yet to meet someone who is willing to die for a lie. Whatever the case might be, here's what we do know is this day, this joyous occasion that we celebrate like today, the resurrection of our Lord, is not just a day that we should wait once a year to celebrate. Here's what we do know is that Christ was risen from the dead. And why is this important? Why is this the very pinnacle of our Christian faith? It was Timothy Keller that said the resurrection. Well, this is the hinge upon which the story of the world pivots. Because this is what makes, at least for the believer, their world. This is what changes everything. Why? Because, listen, as you look at various religions and belief systems around the world today, not one of them has one of their leaders dying for its servants or worshipers, laid in a tomb and then raised from the dead. Why is this so important? Well, see, Paul would go on to say that there is great hope that we have. You see, today... Many of us will probably celebrate in different ways. I always say, be careful how you celebrate. I personally choose and have always opted out to celebrate in a way that would in any way take from the very power of the resurrection. And today it's happening even in churches. 
You see, the thing about all of this is, do we, one, perhaps take for granted the resurrection and the very thing that has made us right with God? Or perhaps maybe the reason why we substitute the resurrection with we have to have a party or a picnic. Or we have to celebrate it in this way with, with baskets and Easter bunnies and eggs. Friend of mine, I'm sorry to break it to you, but that is a substitute for this very powerful teaching today. The sad reality is, is it's not that you're a bad person if that's the practice. You're not going to go to hell, man, if you hide some eggs and go find them, especially the ones that got money in them. Those are the good ones. <laughs> But here's the whole point that I'm trying to get across. How is it that in some way we begin to minimize one of the most pivotal and powerful teachings of the Christian faith? That our God, the Lord Jesus Christ, has raised from the dead. How do you equate that? Like tonight, our kids in their children's ministry production are going to relate this to us, the resurrection of our Lord. There's no greater joy than to teach your children the truth. And the problem is then you wonder why. If you're not teaching them the truth and you're teaching them something else, then you wonder why when they get older, they don't have a love for the Lord. Listen, God doesn't have grandchildren. Your children don't know Jesus because of you as Lord and Savior. Some people think, well, we're Christian. I'm a Christian because my parents were Christian. No, nope, that's not true. God doesn't have grandchildren. He has sons and daughters. And your children need to come to faith in Christ Jesus on their own. They're sinners in need of a savior just like you once were. The truth of the resurrection is one of the most liberating, is one of the most powerful truths that could ever be declared and proclaimed. Is it that we have a lack of understanding? Could we be like those who walked so close with Jesus and we come to the tomb and we still expect to see his body there? How is it that our minds can be so influenced by other things that don't even pale in comparison to the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? It's often been a mystery to me, but in one case I understand that it also is perhaps the fallen nature within us. You know, doubt surrounded the resurrection. Did you know that fear surrounded the resurrection? Did you know that the disparity of all life surrounded the resurrection? Did you know that failure surrounded the resurrection? And did you also know that a heart that was once on fire and believed and proclaimed the resurrection was just a flickering ember when Christ was risen from the dead? You see, all these are found in John's gospel. Some people think, well, you know, here it is. You know, you got the angels that are there. Some suspecting one of the angels to be a gardener. I always say there was Mexicans at the tomb. Anyways. <laughs> but here's what I find. I can say that because I'm Mexican. Anyways. Here's what I find to be true. If there is hope of the resurrection, how does that translate to you and me today? Why are we gathered here? Well, because you know what, Pastor? We came to this service because we got a little fandango to go to after. That's fine. That's fine. But that's not the hope of the resurrection. Our little fandangos and wingdings can't get us into heaven. They can't set us free from the addictions of sin. They can't make us right with God. The Bible clearly says in John chapter 19 in verses chapter 20, excuse me, in verses 11 through 18, we see a very amazing story of a woman who was there at the tomb of Jesus. We read it here in chapter 24 of Luke's gospel. Her name was Mary of Magdala. Now, here's something I want you guys to understand. Mary went first with the women. They went to go and anoint the body of Jesus. Then... When they seen that the tomb was empty, the stone was rolled away, they went back and they, they got the other disciples. They were like, hey, you need to come check this out. So they go back. They're thinking, these women are crazy. As a matter of fact, like most men, what do they say? Idle tales came from these women's mouths. They're crazy. They don't know what they're talking about. Let us go check it out. 
Peter and John, according to John's gospel, go. And they begin to look inside the tomb. And what do they see? That in fact, what these women said was true. The Bible says here in Luke 24 and verse 12 that Peter, when he saw, he seen everything within the tomb. The clouds of, that were on Jesus that his body were wrapped with were laying there and he departed marveling to himself what had happened. He's walking away, blown away. And the Bible says that as the disciples went back, it says here that Mary went back by herself. Mary's heart was grieved. Mary truly believed in her heart that somebody did something with Jesus' body. As a matter of fact, when they appeared to her, there the angel, she says, where did you lay him so I can go and I can get him? Her desire was to go. She really thought Jesus was somewhere else, not thinking that he was risen. Think about the pain that filled her heart. Have you guys ever just studied the story of Mary of Magdalene? I know this movie, The Passion of the Christ, gives a false view of her. She was not a prostitute, so that's false. She was a woman who had seven spirits casted out of her. She was filled with demons. And her life was riddled. Her life was a mess. It was ruined. Some of us might know people like that. Maybe you were once that way. But the day that she came in encounter with Jesus Christ, he set her free and he delivered her. And from that day forward, she followed Jesus and no one or nothing else. And the least that she could do was even follow him to death. Oh, you guys don't see the picture. Mary wept, sorrowful, pain in her heart, and saying, if you have taken him somewhere, just tell me, I'll go. Listen, by herself, she was determined to take the body of her master, her teacher, Jesus, and lay him back in the tomb and do what she intended to do when she went there. And before Jesus allowed her to go deeper into despair, he came at the right time, stood behind her, called her name. Jesus said in John's gospel that his sheep hear his voice. And immediately she turned and she said, Rabboni, my master teacher. The Bible says she clung to Jesus. She held on to him. And those tears of sorrow and pain and disparity of all life became joy. In that moment right there, all the pain and sorrow that she was experiencing, an overwhelming sense of joy came over her because who was behind her? The resurrected Lord. Do you see the idea that we get from this conclusion? Do you know someone that is despaired of all life? Maybe because their spouse has died. Maybe because their child has died. The tragedies, sickness and disease perhaps has been declared over their life. Loss of wealth, betrayal, whatever the case might be, they lose a sense of joy, happiness, and their lives are just full of sorrow. Death seems to be the only way out, they think. Can I tell you guys that because of the resurrection, their sorrow, maybe even yours, can be turned to joy. That's why there's hope in the resurrection. A few verses later, you have the disciples. The Bible says they're, they're filled for, they're afraid. They're in the upper room. They're thinking in their minds, what just happened to Jesus is going to happen to us. It's over, man. It's done. Let me tell you something about this picture. These men seen the dead raised. They seen the miracles of Jesus, and yet here they are, guys. Listen, fearful and afraid. Figuring that. It's just a matter of time before they die. Fear is a terrible thing. Phobias. It is fear sometimes, the fear of man or the fear of timidity. Remember when Paul wrote Timothy in his second letter to him, he says, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Why? Because the spirit of timidity, a spirit of fear, well, it paralyzes you. You know that fear and faith, the fear of timidity and faith cannot coexist. You can't serve two masters, Jesus says. You'll love one and hate the other. What does a life of fear look like? Some of us probably know people that live in fear. 
Well, in John chapter 20, in verses 19 to 23, the disciples were in the upper room and they were fearful. They were afraid. They said, it's over. It's done. Jesus appears to them and says, peace. He says, be still, relax, receive the Holy Spirit. The resurrected Lord appeared to his disciples in this upper room. And he, for that very moment, right there when he appeared, took their fear. And the Bible says later on in the book of Acts that these same disciples became the most courageous apostles of the New Testament church. You see what happens with fear? Because of the resurrection, fear can be turned into courage. What about those doubters that we know? You know them doubters? You know that Christians doubt as well. That's why many of them are weak in their faith. They're not strong Christians because they doubt. They say they believe, they say they love, they say they trust, they say they rest. But they don't do what the scriptures say. When they pray, they doubt. And you shouldn't. But there was a disciple of Jesus who actually doubted. He said, you know what? I got to see it to believe it. It wasn't that he rejected what Jesus said he was. But, but, but what he rejected was the fact that Jesus could be risen from the dead. Mary comes back and tells him. And, and Thomas says, nah, I, I don't know. You know, you, you, you know, you, you know. You had some demons in you before. You're kind of crazy, right? I mean, that's what you would say. I know I would say that. Now, don't listen to her, man. You know, which one are you talking to? Because there's like seven of them in her. Anyways. But Thomas is there and Jesus appears to Thomas. And Jesus says, Thomas, come here. He says, handle me. He says, touch me. Take your hands and put them in my wounds. He says, does a spirit, does a ghost have these wounds like this? Does, does he have this body like this? He says, look, handle me. And Thomas's only response, the doubter was, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Thomas's doubt became belief because Christ was risen from the dead. If you have doubters in your family, if you're a doubter yourself, listen, there is hope. Don't give up on them. How do I know there's hope? Because Christ was risen from the dead. This is a common one. You ever met someone that has fallen? No longer serving the Lord as they once used to. No longer trusting in the word of God or praying. Yeah, we have a term for them. In the church, we call them backsliders, but that's not a proper term. I don't mean that it's not a nice term. It's the right term, but it's not a proper term because people that walk away from the church are not only backsliders. The church is filled with backsliders. Let me put it to you this way. If you don't love Jesus Christ more today than you did yesterday, friend of mine, you're already backslidden in your heart. These people that have fallen from grace or fallen from being in a place where God was once using them feel the most condemnation because this is what the enemy does. He ceases upon the opportunity to discourage them even more. What they fail to realize is that Jesus had told Peter about this fallen state that he would once step into. Remember, it was Jesus who told Peter Peter, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. You could imagine that Peter's mind was like, oh, OK, so what did you say? Jesus says, I didn't say anything. I just I'm praying for you. Wow. And then he says, I prayed that your faith would not fail. Meaning what? You're going to you're going to you're going to fall, Peter. And you will be sifted. I didn't pray for protection. I prayed that you would go through it and not despair of all life. And then Jesus says, and when you come back to me, implying what? You're going to get through it. And when you come back to me, you're going to go and you're going to restore your brethren. In other words, Peter, you're going to go through a very difficult season in your life. And people can criticize Peter and say all of this. They say a lot of things about Peter denying Jesus, but Jesus told him he was going to do this. You can imagine there the final time in which Peter denied Jesus. They had a last conversation. 
You ever heard somebody say, you know, they spoke to me with their eyes? Well, sometimes that's a true statement. And that's exactly what Jesus did with Peter. When Peter denied Jesus for the third time, the Bible says that while Jesus was arrested, apprehended by the priest and his officials, that Jesus looked across the courtyard and locked eyes with his disciple Peter. And it wasn't like what you would say and I'd say, told you. It wasn't that. That look to Peter was, remember what I said, Not that you would fail, but that you would get through it. And I love John chapter 21 in verses 15 through 19, because that's what Jesus did. He went and he met Peter. And the famous question, Peter, do you love me? And Jesus restored Peter. That who was once fallen has now been restored. Can I tell you? That those that have fallen from grace, those that have stepped away, yes, my heart aches because I know the turmoil and the trouble and all the things they're going to go through. But I know that because of God's goodness and faithfulness, because Christ is risen from the dead, they can be restored. My hope is in the power of the resurrection. Maybe we're not fallen. Maybe... Ministry and church and what we do and what we say, it's kind of like a switch. We can turn it on and turn it off. We call those light switch Christians. Kind of like the two on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24, the text that's before us. These were disciples of Jesus. As a matter of fact, these disciples of Jesus are leaving Jerusalem while the disciples are in the upper room in Jerusalem. Everybody's there. And these two find it necessary to leave. What was their problem? Well, the Bible says here that these guys are talking about what had transpired and the resurrected Lord comes alongside them. They don't know that it's him and he engages them in a conversation and as they begin to speak with him, you know, Jesus is like, what are you talking about? And they're like, where have you been? Have you not heard of what's gone on? And they begin to talk about this individual who they were following and he says, we thought he was going to be the one and now it's the third day and we've heard that he's risen from the dead. But they're still walking away from Jerusalem. They followed Jesus. They testified of his miracles and the raising of the dead. All the things that the disciples seen, these ones seen also. But remember, not everybody who follows Jesus follows him for the right things. These two uh, on the road to Emmaus remind me of a lot of people in the Christian faith. Jesus underperformed. And he wasn't who they thought he was to be. The Bible says in verse 21 of chapter 24, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all this, today is the third day since these things have happened. We thought he was going to be the one, but he wasn't. Isn't this interesting? And then Jesus gives them a very profound truth about their heart. Verse 25, Jesus says, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Jesus said, the issue is your heart, your slow of heart, your dual of heart. You see this one heart of fire that you had on fire for me when you were walking with me, it was going because you were getting everything from me. It was good. You thought I was going to redeem Israel. They were like the ones that were saying, Hosanna, save now at Jesus' triumphal entry. And now that Jesus is dead and died on the cross in their mind, well, there goes our political savior. How do I know this? Because they're going back to Emmaus. Emmaus is where it all started with Judas Maccabees and the Maccabean revolt. And if you were from Emmaus, well, guess what? You were there putting together a political leader that can deliver Israel from their political uh, need and uh, Rome being over them. And this is what they were doing. They were going back and what they were going to do was look for another savior that could lead them. Imagine how Jesus, listen to this, left Jerusalem, left the tomb, left the disciples, left everybody to go after these two. Why? Because Jesus said, You leave the 99 and go after the one. What good would it be for Jesus to say it and not do it? 
Jesus then, we know, as they get closer to Emmaus, it's getting dark in the evening. And all of a sudden, Jesus says, I can no longer go with you any further. And they said, no, please stay with us. Please take the time and, 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 and sit with us and have a meal. They compelled, the Bible says, Jesus to stay with them. And Jesus then goes and he stays with them. And it was there at that meal that all of a sudden Jesus decided to reveal himself to them. And the Bible says their eyes were open. And immediately when they saw Jesus, before they could even respond, Jesus disappeared. What was so amazing about that passage is this is what they said. Then their eyes were opened and they knew him. And he vanished from their sight and they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us? Well, he talked to us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us. That little ember, that little tiny flame that was no longer that powerhouse of a flame was now turned back on fire as Jesus began to reason from the scriptures. Can you imagine that Bible study that Jesus was giving him about himself? And the Bible says their hearts begin to burn within them. And the Bible says in verse 33, so they rose up that very moment right then and there. And guess what they did? They went back to Jerusalem. They said, Emmaus, later with you. You know, sometimes that's how we follow Jesus. We only follow him to get what we need in the moment that we need. And that's why our hearts are not on fire for Jesus. But let me tell you something. There is hope if it's not. Because he can take a flickering little flame of a heart and set it ablaze once again because of the resurrection. You see, all of this hinges on the resurrection. Paul takes it a step further and he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 11. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. This is the reason why we proclaim the gospel and the resurrection of Jesus Christ so that they will believe. Christ, the resurrection, and his resurrected stories that we see here in the Gospels proves there's a resurrection. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, some didn't believe. Some rejected, some believed. He's writing to the church. Now, listen, guys, you might think, how could people not believe this? Let me tell you, this is common even here at Living Way. How a person believes in the resurrection is how they live. That's key. Satan believes in Jesus. The Bible says the demons tremble at his name. I see very few Christians that tremble at the name of Jesus. We should. We should walk in the fear of the Lord. But it's an interesting dynamic that sometimes we can read the passage here. How is it that we can come to a place like those at Corinth? Listen, guys, 23 years after the resurrection, over 2,000 years later, has much really changed with the church? The very day that Christ was risen from the dead, the disciples didn't even believe that he was raised. How do we break free from this and live a life filled with the power of the resurrection? Well, let's understand what it would look like if Christ did not rise from the dead. What if Jesus' body was still in that tomb today? He goes on to say in verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Number one, if Christ had not risen from the dead, the preaching of Christ would be senseless and meaningless. Senseless and meaningless. Number two, faith in Christ would be useless. What do we have if Christ is not risen from the dead? Verse 15 says, yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. Number three, all testimony and witness and preaching and preachers of the resurrection would be liars. None of us like liars, right? I guess you guys do. <laughs> Nobody wants to be lied to. Verse 
Verse 16 says, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, listen to this, your faith is futile. It's futile. You are still in your sins. That's a very powerful, powerful verse. What were you like before you came to know Jesus? What was your home like? What were the things you were involved in? What were the things that had you bound and addicted? What were those things that you were doing that were destroying you and destroying those around you? Friend of mine, do you understand that the very hope and power of the resurrection sets us free from the bondage of sin? What were you doing? This is not a time to give your little bragamony, okay? But this is a time to understand how lost and how destitute you were and what you destroyed and what was ravaged. Let me tell you something here. Sin was ruining you. Imagine still being in that condition and that place. No one would be redeemed from sin. Imagine what our lives would be like right now if we were not redeemed from sin. What would you be doing? Where would you be at today? Some of you would say death. Yes, but eternally separated. You would be in hell. Don't say death, say hell. Think about this for a moment. And because being redeemed from sin, God not will only spare us from hell, but he will spare us from living life like we're in hell. Our sins would not be forgiven. Verse 18 says, then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. What about this? Guys, listen, the believer, the hope of the resurrection, this is how we're able to proclaim this. This was the conversation that Jesus was having with, with Martha and Mary about their brother Lazarus when he says, no, hold on, I am the resurrection. You guys understand how powerful the resurrection is? I already know that common Christian response on the resurrection is, we're going to heaven, Pastor Dave. You're wrong. That's not the end of it. That's what Jesus died for. But he was raised from the dead. Listen, so that you can be raised also. Do you understand that your final destination is not while well, we get saved so we go to heaven? No, it's so that we could be raised from the dead. And this might twist some of your theology because you probably don't have none. But in the Bible, it says this. We are coming back again to rule and to reign with Christ in resurrected, glorified bodies. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Think about that for a moment. Oh, go and try to preach that at work. Go. It sounds like some sci-fi story or some weird, uh, you know, thought of aliens invading the earth. And, and listen, we talk about the cute little stories about, well, Jesus is my savior. We'll tell them that. You want to know what? We're going to come back. If you get left behind, you're going to be in that messed up body. And I'm going to be in a glorified body because Christ was risen from the dead. You know that that's the theology behind the resurrection that you will be resurrected also. This is why this belief was rejected by Greek philosophers because they say, how can we in this filthy flesh be raised from the dead? The Bible says that this corruption will take on incorruption. This mortal body will take on immortality. That this very body that we have now, and guys, listen, how the glorified body is going to look, I don't know. But we will do everything that Jesus did in his glorified body. Oh, this is hard for some people to swallow because the resurrection leads us to the end times. We're going to be resurrected so we can rule and reign with Christ, not in heaven, because there's no need for us to rule and reign, but here on earth. Do you understand that? Because of the resurrection, we are co-heirs with Christ and we will rule and we will reign on this earth. Guys, listen, not bound by the sins that keep our flesh in bondage. It's funny sometimes that as I begin to talk about the end times and I talk about this glorified body and I talk about people come up to me after they're like, that's really in the Bible. Blows my mind. Of course, it's in the Bible. How it all works, I don't know, but Jesus was the first to do it, and we just follow his example. Think about it, guys. We work so hard on fixing this thing up right now. Now, I know for some of you it needs an overhaul. For some of us, we need, you know, 
you know, new lights so we can see and, and, you know, and all that stuff. You know, we got to hook it up. I get all that. I'm okay with that. But you can try on this side of eternity and spend a wealth and do a lot that you can do, but nothing will restore this body like the resurrection. Listen to this. What happens to our loved ones if Christ has not risen? What comforts your heart when a loved one who knows the Lord has passed away? Where are they? With Jesus. Right? And we say what the scriptures allow us to say. We can't go with them, or excuse me, they can't come back to us, but we know we can go to them. That's what the scriptures teach. Right? But if it were not for the resurrection, listen, if there was no resurrection, listen to this. Our loved ones would not be in heaven. Our parents, our grandparents, our children, our siblings, our friends. All former believers, loved ones, would have all died as fools. And our belief that they were somewhere would be simply foolish. As we close, he says here in verse 19, if then this life only we have in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. In other words, if Christ had not risen from the dead, the preaching of Christ would be senseless and meaningless. Faith in Christ would be useless. All the testimony and witness and preaching of the resurrection would be lies. No one would be redeemed from sin. All former believers, loved ones, family members, and friends would have died as fools. And believers would be the most foolish, pitiable people in the world. Now, I know sometimes the enemy makes us feel that way. But that's not the truth. Look at verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Do you know what that means when it says he's become the first fruits? It means that Christ rose first. The promise is we will rise after. He is the first fruits of our resurrection. So what does that do for us? I want to give you guys a picture and a prayer that I think is important. In the Valley of the Vision, here's a prayer that has gone out. Listen to this prayer. I think it kind of sums everything up. Oh, Heavenly Father, teach me to see that if Christ has pacified thee and satisfied divine justice, he can also deliver me from my sins. That Christ does not desire me, now justified, to live in self-confidence in my own strength. It gives me the law of the spirit of life to enable me to obey thee. That the spirit and his power are mine by resting on Christ's death. That the spirit of life within me answers to the law without. That if I sin not, I should thank thee for it. That if I sin, I should be humbled daily under it. That I should mourn for sin more than other men do. For when I see... I shall die because of sin. That makes me mourn. When I see how sin strikes at thee, that makes me mourn. When I see that sin caused Christ's death, that makes me mourn. That sanctification is the evidence of reconciliation, proving that faith has truly apprehended Christ, thou hast taught me. That faith is nothing else than receiving thy kindness. That it is an adherence to Christ, a resting on him, love clinging to him as a branch to a tree, to seek life and vigor from him. I thank thee for showing me the vast difference between knowing things by reason and knowing them by the spirit of faith. By reason, I see a thing is so. By faith, I know it as it is. I have seen thee by reason and have not been amazed. I have seen thee as thou art in thy son and have been ravished to behold thee. I bless thee that I am thine in my Savior, 
Jesus. 